بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله على ما أنأم وله الشكر على ما ألهم والثناء بما قدم بأموم من ابتداها وسبوغ آلاء أسداها وتمام من نوالاها وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له كلمة جعل الإخلاص تأويلها وذمن القلوب موسولها والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا أبي القاسم محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين المأسومين المذلومين المنتخبين المنتجبين الذين كلامهم نور وأمرهم رشد ووسيتهم التقوى وفعلهم الخير وعادتهم الإحسان وسجيتهم الكرم لا سيما على المخفية قبرها المخسوبة حقها المذلوم بعلها سيدتي نساء العالمين بذعة الرسول فاطمة البتول قال مولانا أبو جعفر عليه السلاة والسلام يا ممتحنة امتحنك الله الذي خلقك قبل أن يخلقك فوجدك لمن امتحنك صابرا صلى الله على محمد وآل محمد If a person looks at the riwayat, they find that there are three places mentioned in riwayat that are the possible places of the grave of Zahra alayhi salam. The first being in Jannatul Baqi. The second, we are told, mentioned in riwayat, is that she was buried in her house. And today, if a person goes to uh, Medina Tul Munawwara and Masjid al Nabawi, they find that, as we know, the houses of all of the Mu'mineen were connected to the Masjid and the house of Zahra alayhi salatu was salam, which is in actual fact a small room, is connected right next to what today we would call the grave of the Prophet of Islam. So one riwayat said that she was buried in Baqi. The other riwayah came and said that she was buried in her own house. And the third came and said that she was buried between the member of the Prophet of Islam and his grave. In a place known as Rawdatun min Riyadh al-Jannah or a piece of paradise. For as we know and as riwayat tell us that there are certain pieces of land on this earth which are actually pieces of Jannah. Of them, the land of Karbala is said to be actually a part of Jannah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala placed on this earth. Likewise, Ar-Rawdha min Riyadh al-Jannah between the member of the Prophet of Islam and between his grave. Which is why today when a person goes to Umrah and Hajj and does the ziyarah of the Imma alayhim salam and Ma'sumin in Medina, they'll find many people waiting to pray two units of prayer in that area which is Ar-Rawdha min Riyadh al-Jannah. So that is the third area where we're told she may have been buried. When a person looks at then the riwayat that the ulama have mentioned, certain ziyarat of Az-Zahra alayhi salatu wasalam are specific for these certain places. For example, one of the Imams comes and says, if you wish to do ziyarah of my grandmother, Farrawdha, then recite this ziyarah. And if you wish to do the ziyarah of my grandmother in Baqi, then recite this ziyarah. And if you wish to recite the ziyarah of my grandmother in her house, then recite this one. So each place had its own specific ziyarah. 
of the most well-known ziyarat, which is an actual fact, a ziyarah of when I wish to visit her, if she's buried in Rawdha. She's buried in one of these three. We don't know where it is. Each of them has its own ziyarah. If I wish to recite that ziyarah of Rawdha min Riyadh al-Jannah, then Imam al-Jawad, salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhi, gave us this ziyarah. That if you wish to recite the ziyarah of my grandfather, grandmother in Rawdha, then recite these words. And this is most probably the most well-known of ziyarat mentioned by Sheikh Abbas Qummi and his Mafati and others, you can find it afterwards, uh, of the most well-known ziyarat of Az-Zahra alayhi salatu was salam. But most interestingly is that when the Imam, Salamullah alayhi, begins the ziyarah, he says, Ya mumtahanatum tahanakillah. He addresses his grandmother as Zahra alayhi salatu was salam by saying, O oh, the one that had gone through imtihan and trial and tribulation, the one that was tested by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Normally, when does imtihan take place? Trials and tribulations, when do they take place? Fit dunya, after I'm created and I'm coming to this earth, on, onto this earth. However, the ziyarah says, Oh, the one that was tested by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before she came into this world. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tested her, he found her to be sabira, he found her to be patient. Today in our last night of these three nights commemorating as Zahra alayhi salam, I wish to look at this line, Ya mumtahanatum tahanakillah. Oh, the one that was tested by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before she came onto this earth, before she was created. What was meant by this and why did the Imam say these words? Before we can go into that, however, there's a number of questions that come about tabi'atul imtihan wal imtihan fid dunya. The first question, therefore, that arises is what do we mean when we say imtihan? As I've said before, to translate something into English may be easy, but does it have the correct meaning or not is a different question. When it comes to this word imtihan, literally the scholars of linguistics, they tell us that imtihan used to refer to when a person, for example, mines gold from the ground. When he has this ore of gold, which is mixed with pure gold and other impurities, he takes this piece of gold. Like anyone that mines precious metals, of course it comes out impure. He takes this piece of gold which is mixed with impurity and purity and he treats it in such a way by heating it. When they would heat this piece of gold, this was classified in Arabi as imtahana. So they'd say imtahana dhahab. Imtahana dhahab meaning I heated up that piece of gold and treated it in such a way that the impurities were separated from the purities and what was left was a pure piece of gold. And from this, therefore, we add the word imtihan, which is translated today as trials and tribulations, adversity and tests from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why? For the same idea that in the way that I heat that piece of gold to remove the impurities so that a pure piece of gold remains, any type of test today, when anything goes through a test and an imtihan, goes for the same reason. When a person in university or college or school has an imtihan, has a test for the same reason. So that the impurity, which is what? Which is that person's ignorance, is made manifest from the purity, which is that person's ilm and knowledge. When I test a product that I have, a phone that I have, whatever it may be, I wish to see that which is good within it and differentiate it from that which is anax or that which should be removed. And this is why therefore imtihan or test were called imtihan. If this has been understood, and yes, Quranul Kareem uses a number of different words for trial and tribulation and adversity. Whether it be ibtila, ikhtibar, we have these in riwayat, imtihan, ikhtibar, ibtila, fitna, all of these are different words. And we don't need to go into those details. However, if we understood what the original meaning of the word was, a number of questions arise before we can get to this idea of why Az-Zahra alayhi salatu was salam was called Ya Mumtahana and what was the philosophy behind the Imam calling her such. The first question that comes about this word Imtihan is why is it? That whether a person looks in Qur'anul Kareem or whether a person looks in Riwayat, they find this idea that a mu'min cannot be a mu'min unless and until they have imtihan on a regular basis. 
open for example Kafi right now of Al Kulaini and you'll find a number of riwayat that says if a mu'min is a mu'min they can't go 40 days on this earth except for some sort of imtihan some sort of trial and tribulation no matter how small it may be for example I had a headache one day this may be a trial from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala I lost a small amount of money a few pounds trial from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala I missed my flight I missed a train this is also a, tr a trial and test from Allah azza wa jal why was it then that Quran al kareem would say ahasib an nas do people think that they can say they have iman and they won't be tested of course you're going to be tested. Why was it that Riwayat said that part and parcel of someone who has Iman in his heart will have to go through imtihan and ikhtibar and test? What was the reason behind this? Others may have tests or not. Why the stress on the mu'min? And the answer, a number of answers were given by ulama. I wish to give two before we continue with the discussion. One of those is explained to us by one of the imma alayhi wassalatu wassalam when he tells us about a prophet of God that this prophet of God enters into a city now who the prophet of God was as we know many prophets of God we don't have their names they weren't mentioned in riwayat who exactly they were a prophet from Banu Israel a prophet from a nation as he's entering into that city he sees that all of the walls of the city are covered with black Every single shop, every single business is closed. And whoever he sees on the road, he sees they are wearing black clothing. So he understands that naturally, which is part of the, the fitra and the tabi'a, is black often has the uh, connotation of a tragedy. Someone has passed away, bereavement. He realized someone must have passed away. However, this person must have been someone azim. Because if it wasn't someone great or known or respected in the society, why would all of the shops be closed? Why would the whole city be covered in black? Why would every single person that he sees is wearing black clothing? So he enters and of course he wants to know who is it that has passed away? So he asks a few people that are there, who is it that has passed away that everyone is commemorating and mourning for? And the response came, the, the ruler of the city, the king of this province, he died a few days ago and all of the city has been in a number of days of mourning now straight away something came to the mind of that prophet of God. Which was what? Which was that, that ruler of this city who, who, who I knew and I was aware of. He was number one an oppressor. Thalim. Number two he doesn't believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He doesn't believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's tawheed. He wasn't someone that had good qualities and characteristics. Yet he has such honor that after his death so many people are remembering him. Such honor and is there that so many people are speaking about him, commemorating him. Everyone is closing their businesses for three days for one week. So it's slightly strange. So he carries on walking. And of course, he never doubts the hikmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the question entered into his heart. He carries on walking when he can smell something. A very bad odor. He looks uh, towards his right. He sees that there is a wall in one of the alleyways of the city. There is a wall that has fallen over onto a person. So that wall had collapsed onto this person. And unfortunately no one realized that this has taken place. This person has been lying dead for who knows how many days. Who knows how many hours. So when he smelt this he ran towards the body. He removes the, uh, the wall or whatever he can remove. And he sees that this person was one of the best of the mu'mineen of this city. So of course, even though he's completely in taslim and submits to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of course he's going to ask the question that the ruler who is zalim, the ruler who doesn't believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, maqam, status, is the honor after he dies. And this person who's a mu'min, who's sahib ul iman, such a dishonorable death that for how many days has his body been here, no one even knows. No one is there to give him ghusl, kafan, to care about him and he's lying there. So this prophet of God, he stands, he performs the ghusl, kafan, the burial rites of this mu'min and he asks Allah. He says, Ya Allah, increase for me in my ma'rifah and wisdom for I wish to see why. Why is it that you do that which you do in this way? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals to him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that mu'min has done many things which are seen to be good. 
He's performed acts of disobedience that which takes him closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and for that his reward will be in the akhirah. وَالْجَنَّةُ لِلْمُتَّقِينَ وَالْمُؤْمِنِينَ However, that mu'min in his life also did that which I wasn't pleased with. Of the things that he did that I wasn't pleased with is he wanted something. When he wanted something, instead of asking me, asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he went, I could have easily given that to him if he asked it from me. Instead of asking me, you know when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when someone asks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for something, often Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes another mu'min a wasila, an intermediary. I want something, I ask Allah azza wa jal, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes one of his khalq a wasila and an intermediary for me to get that thing. However, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told this prophet of God that he wanted something, where did he go? He asks that ruler who is dhalim, who's an oppressor, who doesn't believe in me, who tells people that religion is something that doesn't exist, Allah is someone that doesn't exist, he went to that person. And so because he asked a dhalim and an oppressor of his needs and didn't come to me directly, he committed a sin. I can punish that mu'min in the akhirah. I can punish him in the next world. However, why would I make him go through the punishment of the akhirah? Bil akhir, at the end of the day, he needs to be punished. This is the justice of Allah Azza wa Jal. So what did I do? I punished him in the dunya. I gave him a dishonorable death in such a way, and that dishonorable death was the punishment for what he did by asking adhalim or for his needs. So that when he enters then into the akhirah, all I have to give him are my, are my bounties and reward. The sins that he's committed through the trials of this dunya, he's already paid for. As for that uh, king, that ruler, he also has committed many acts of disobedience. Sin after sin after sin, oppression after oppression. And for, him, for that he will be given his punishment in the akhirah. However, he also did that which was good. He performed acts which were seen to be good, righteous. And so instead of rewarding him or giving his reward in the akhirah, I gave him his reward in this dunya. Allah gives reward. Allah is just. He gave him his reward based on that person's action in the akhirah. What was in the dunya? What was his reward? That he had such an honorable death. So many people cried for him. So many people remembered him. This was his reward. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, what was the good deed that that king had done? What was the good deed? He answered the request of a mu'min. That mu'min by asking that king went against what I wished. But that king, he answered the request of a mu'min. This was something seemed to be hasan, good. And so I rewarded him in this dunya, in the akhirah he gets his punishment. Therefore we understood straight away that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, why does he specifically say the mu'min goes through trial and tribulation? Because when the mu'min commits sin, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wishes for that mu'min and mu'mina, that sahib iman to have paid their punishment for their sins in this world, so they come to the next world getting only the reward of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why the mu'min was told, you're going to go through problems and difficulty. And this was one of the greatest of mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Which is why the narration says when the mu'min goes into the akhirah, he'll pray and wish, if only I was given more trial and tribulation in, that, in the dunya, so I had this higher status in the akhirah. So this was the first reason why we saw again and again, imtihan mu'min, imtihan mu'min. For Allah doesn't want to punish you in the akhirah. If he has to punish you, he gives you trial and tribulation. Other than this, the second reason that I'll mention can be explained through an example. And of course, the philosophy of imtihan and ibtila was something that uh, a lengthy discussion can be had and the ulama have discussed. This example, imagine there's two rooms. One room I'm sitting in. Beautiful carpet, comfortable, temperature is perfect. All of my friends are with me in that room. Whatever food I require, whatever I like to drink, everything is there that I would need. I'm so comfortable, happy. I sit there for one hour, then I go into another room. I'm taken to the next room. That other room is cold. The light isn't on. It's dark. I can't sit down properly. It's dirty. There's nothing. Uh, if I get hungry, there's nothing there for me to uh, eat. There's nothing there to quench my thirst. 
If I have these type of rooms, one with all of the things that I require, all of the things that I wish for, I'm very happy. The best people that I love are in that room. In the other one, no one. Nothing is there. What's going to happen to that person the second he goes to that other room? When he goes to that second room, because there is nothing there, he's going to wish and desire that he doesn't stay here. He goes back to where he came from. Because there's nothing here. That fulfills my desires, that entertains me, that gives me comfort. I wish to go back to where I was. Likewise, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says the mu'min, where was the origin of the mu'min? Where is his original place? Jannah. The bounties of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says, when I place you in this dunya, yes, I gave you many bounties. Alhamdulillah, we have many bounties of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, especially living in this country, we have so many things. Allah gave us many bounties. But then he brings us that odd trial, tribulation, imtihan. Every so often, so that our heart yearns for that place where there's happiness but no sorrow. Where there's health but no sickness. And the way that that person in the second room wishes to go to the first where I had everything. I yearn to go there. Likewise, when I have imtihan and ibtila in this dunya, I yearn for the akhirah where none of these things exist. If the mu'min wasn't given these trials and tribulations in the dunya, he would love the dunya too much. He wouldn't remember the akhirah. So that's some of the reasons, therefore, why we have this idea of imtihan and mu'min. If that has been understood, the second question then comes is if this mu'min has imtihan from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah azza wa jal says, I'll give you imtihan and test you, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala must have also given me a way to get through this test. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala must have given me the tools through which I can get through this test. And so what was the way or some of the ways that were mentioned? That were some of the best ways that a mu'min and believer can get through the trials and tribulations of this dunya. And I think 2020 was a be the best example to remind us of some of the struggles of this world. However, we were told of the many things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us to help us go through that adversity of this world. Many examples exist. Of those... So how, how my, what my mentality should be or what things if I remember and think about help me get through the imtihan and ibtila. Of those is a very interesting riwayah that some of the muhaddithin have narrated from Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhi sallu ala muhammadin wa ala muhammad. They say that the holy Imam salamullah alayhi when he's in Medina a woman comes to him one day, a mother. She comes to him, she says, Yabna Rasulullah, my son had gone on a business trip, methalan, some sort of trip to Sham, somewhere uh, far away, and he's meant to have come back this morning. He still hasn't returned. For a mother, of course, this is one of the most difficult things. It's not that she can message him, she can't contact him, it's not like today. So I don't know where he is. He should have come back, he's still not here. My heart is restless. Is he okay? What's going to happen? Give me patience. How can I have patience? This is one of her imtihan. Imtihana, sometimes a child, is one of the biggest imtihan for his parents. So the Imam Salamullah Ali uh, says to her, have patience and go back home. Have sabr. She says, okay, Ibn Rasulullah. She goes back home. She's a mother at the end of the day. She comes back after uh, half an hour, one hour. Ya ibn Rasulullah, he's still not here. What can I do? I can't think straight. I can't think about anything else. Where is he? Tell me. So the imam says, have sabr, have patience. Go back home. When eventually then she comes a third time. When she comes the third time, the riwayah says at this time she was fi ghayatil iftirab. Here she's the most restless that a person can be. You can see she's very worried. So at that moment when the imam sees her that she's at the highest level of worry and ihtirab, the imam told her, return to your house for your son has returned. Go back, your son has returned. She says, I went back to my house. As I returned to my house, I saw that just about to enter into the house. At the doorstep was my son. I hugged him, I asked him, why were you late, what happened, etc. Are you okay? I asked for his hal. Then I went back to who? The holy Imam, salamullah alayhi. 
I returned back to my Imam. I said, Ya Ibn Rasulullah, thank you that my son has returned safe and sound. I thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But I have a question. How did you know? I said, what do you mean? I came to you first. Uh, you said he's not going to come back yet. Have patience. I came a second time. You said have patience. So other than the ilm al ghaib and all of this, how did you know? How could you tell that the third time when I had come that my son has, is going to be uh, returning back in, in a few moments? How did you know? So the imam then tells us something. And this is one of those things that should help every single person with the adversity and imtihan that a mu'min faces. Qa'idah, principle. Which is that he says Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you sabr, hasn't he? She says, yes, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given me sabr. She says, Allah, he said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he sees that your sabr and patience has reached its highest level, when you can't have any more patience, that's when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings the faraj and release. I.e. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave me a level of patience, he gave you a level of patience. Because my level of patience method is lower, I, do, I can't have that much patience as yours. I'll have imtihan. But that imtihan and trial and tribulation will always be in line with the amount of patience that I have. Never will Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give his servant that which he can't handle, that which they're unable to bear. And when therefore I've had patience and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has seen the sabr of his abd, that's when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showers his bounties. And so the quality of sabr is such, he gave it to all of us. And based on that sabr that he gave me, he will give me imtihan. And as we know, the promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is yes, you may have one unit of imtihan, but with that comes two units of ease. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave a lot of ease to the mu'min. And the mu'min thanks Allah. And when he gives him imtihan, he says, I gave you the sabr. And never will I give you trial and tribulation which you are unable to handle. If these three discussions have been understood, what imtihan meant? Why was it that a mu'min has to have imtihan? And how it was that a mu'min can get through the imtihan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? The question then comes, why would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala test Fatima to Zahra alayhi salam? And what was this test that she goes through before she was created? Ya mumtahanatum tahanakillah alladhi khalaqaki qabla an yakhluqak Before he created you, he tested you. And he found you, ya Zahra, to be sabirah. He found you to have patience. Here the scholars, when they came to analyze this line of ziyara, some said we don't know. At the end of the day, we don't have a ma'soom in, in front of us. When the ma'soom does the hur and we have him in front of us, we can ask him, Ya Ibn Rasulullah, what was the meaning of this? Why was it that your grandmother was called Mumtahana? And what test did she go through before she came into this world? I.e. before she had this physical body. In whatever form she was, Allah tested her. One group said, we don't know. We don't know what it means. Another group of scholars said, that I mentioned at the beginning, what was the whole idea of imtihan purification? And so what this was actually saying is imtihan. Here wasn't in the meaning of Allah tested you before you came into this world. The meaning of ya mumtahana was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala purified you to the highest level of purification. I.e. He created you so pure ya Zahra, then He placed you onto this earth. And how pure was Father Majjus Zahra alayhi salam? That, that if a person looks at her life and see the incidences that take place, you find small things that show us the purity of Zahra. For example, when someone would come to the house, a person asks for something, O oh, daughter of the Prophet, is there anything you can give us? On the rare occasion, I mentioned in the first night, on the rare occasion she has some money with her. She takes it out, but before she gives it, do you know what she does? She takes a cloth. She begins to clean that dirham or dinar. If she has some sort of fragrance, she puts fragrance on that dirham and dinar. Then she gives it from behind the door to that sail, to that person asking. And when someone would see this again and again, one of the servants of the house, that Ya Zahra, whenever someone comes and asks you for something, before you give it, first you clean it, then you wash it. If you have fragrance, your musk, you put it on the, the, the dirham and dinar, then you give it. What's the reason behind it? Look at the purity of Zahra. 
She says, what, when I give someone to something else, I don't give it to them in the best state possible? For when I give an act of charity in the way of Allah, first, metaphorically, first it goes in the hands of Allah, then it goes into the hands of this sail and faqir. And so I wish for this dirham and dinar to go in the hands of Allah in the most pure of forms. The purity of Zahra alayhi salam can be understood when the imma alayhi salam infallible say for us our role model is Fatima Zahra. This sentence is enough for us to understand the purity of Zahra. Our role model is our grandmother as Zahra alayhi salam. So the second opinion was what? The second opinion was that imtihan here meant purification. The third, however, that we say is I said at the beginning, imtihan, trial, tribulation comes when there's impurity. Because there is impurity in my soul and I have committed sin, imtihan therefore comes to remove the impurity, the sins of my soul and the diseases of my heart. However, if this is the reason behind imtihan, why then do we have riwayat from the anbiya and a'imma that say that no one goes through imtihan and trials and tribulations like, like the prophets of God, like the infallibles? If imtihan is because I sin, one of the reasons or the main reasons is I sin. And to purify my soul, I go through trial and tribulation. Why then does a ma'asum say we have the most of imtihan? There's no sin that is there. For example, Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. For the love of Fatima to Zahra alayhi salatu wasalam, recite a second salawat. The Prophet of Islam, on one occasion, he sees a, one of the believers, he says that there is not even one person. Except that when their soul is coming out of their body, they have difficulty. In fact, he says, in fact, this is also one of the imtihan of the prophets of God. That even a prophet of God, when his soul is coming out of his body, he feels difficulty. So maybe the question has come into your mind as well. The person said, Ya Rasulullah. We heard all type of riwayat from you about how difficult it is when a person's soul is coming out of your body. A prophet of God feels that? He says, no, don't misunderstand me. He says, for example, if you're in tawaf of hajj and someone comes next to you and just pushes you slightly on your, onto your shoulder, there's no pain, but there's a bit of difficulty. He says, that's the example of what prophets of God, for example, feel when their soul is coming out of their body. However, at the end of the day, it's one of the imtihan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that prophet of God. Therefore, if I said imtihan comes to purify me of my sins, why then does a prophet of God through, go through imtihan? Why then does Zahra, is Zahra called mumtahana? So the answer comes, that person who wishes to test his gold, or to purify his gold. There's two reasons why he would test his gold. The first reason why he warms up his gold and goes through imtihan is to remove the impurity. The other reason that he tests it and makes it go through imtihan is to show everyone how pure this is and that no impurity is found within it. Sometimes I test it, or I, 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 I treat it to remove that which is impure. But sometimes for people to see the purity if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't test an infallible, how would we know the purity of that infallible? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests them, so we realize that this person is 100% pure. That's why he tested Anbiya. And there's a riwayah to prove this. Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq sallallahu alayhi says, a person comes on the day of Qiyamah who was beautiful. He was tested with his beauty. He had committed a lot of sin. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala came to him and said, why did you commit sin in the dunya? So what's the, what's the nature of the human being? Even in akhirah, the nature remains. He blames someone else. In dunya, I'd blame this person and that person. In the akhirah, I blame Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why did you commit sin? Ya Allah, you made me beautiful. Because you made me beautiful, I committed sin. So at that moment in time, the riwayah says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls Nabi Allah Yusuf. And says, who was given more beauty? You or Yusuf? Of course Yusuf. I.e., who was given more imtihan? Yusuf alayhi salam. Did he commit one sin because of his beauty? No. Then you have no excuse. A woman comes, why did you commit sin? Ya Allah, you made me 
beautiful. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls Lady Maryam alayha salam. Who is more beautiful? The woman says Maryam. Then you have no uh, excuse. She was also tested. But look at the perfection of her character. A third person comes and says, Allah says to him, why did you commit sin? Ya Rasulullah, because you gave me trial and tribulation. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls Nabiullah Ayyub. Who has more trial and tribulation? You or Ayyub? He says, of course, Ayyub alayhi salam. If he committed no sin, you have no excuse. So one of the reasons why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes the infallible go through imtihan is to show the purity of their character. Which is why then when we wish to understand Ya Mum Tahanatum Tahanakillah, O oh, the one that before you came into this world, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told you of the trials and tribulations and the difficulties that you will face, but he saw you to be in Kamalu Tahara. And he saw you to be in Kamalu Sabr and patience. If you look at any other ziyarah, this ziyarah has been narrated in two ways. This way, which I'm going to quote now, is the more well known of narrations. Which is what? If you look at any other ziyarah, other ziyarat, they don't begin, they normally begin with Assalamu alayka. Assalamu alayka ya Amin Allah fi arde wa hujjatahu ala ibadeh. Wa Assalamu alayka ya Aba Abdullah. Assalamu alayka ya Nabi Allah. They begin with salutations. But this is that ziyarah that doesn't begin with salam. And the scholars, they interpret this. Sometimes I go to someone's house, I go to meet someone. First, I ask them about how they are. I send my salams to them, then I begin a conversation. Whereas sometimes someone has just passed away in their house. An accident has just happened. A tragedy has just happened. I go to them, do I ask them first how they are? No, straight away I begin conversation. Someone has just passed away, I'm going to say, how are you? How was your day? Straight away I give them condolences. He said, this is the reason why straight away Imam Jawad, alayhi salam, when he gives us the ziyarah of his grandmother Zahra, he doesn't say, As-salamu alayki ya Fatima zahra Rather, it was as if the Imam is in such awe and in such, uh, he's so uh, taken up by this tragedy of what has taken place, is in so much grief that straight away out of his mouth comes the words, oh, the one that was tested by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what type of test? For many, they don't realize that for days upon days, she stays in that state with her ribs broken. She stays in that state that when she wants to, wants to stand, she either calls Hassan or Hussein or Zainab or Um Kulthum or Fidda. Days after days. She spends either going, crying, in Baytul Huzn, crying to Rasulullah. Yet not once do you find a Zahra alayhi salatu wasalam complain about herself and what happens. She complains about the haqq that was taken. She complains about the haqq of the Muslimin and the Mu'mineen. She complains about what happens to Amirul Mu'mineen, salamullah alayhi. Until eventually she becomes weaker and weaker and weaker. And those that are there to take care of her, they see that she becomes as if a shadow. As if a shadow. The poet would say, Al-Wathibina li zulmi ali Muhammadin. Wa Muhammadun mulqan bila takfini Al-Wathibina li zulmi ali Muhammadin. Wa Muhammadun Mulkan Bilal Takfini Wa Mujamma'i Hatabin Ala Al-Bayt Al-Ladhi Lam Yajtami' Lawla'i Shamlu Al-Dini Wa Al-Dakhilin Ala Al-Batulati Baytiha والمسقطين لها أز جنين خلوا ابن أمي أو لا أكشف رأسي للدعاء خلوا ابن أمي أو لا أكشف رأسي للدعاء وأشكو 
When they see their mother in this state, Zainab and Um Kulthum, the first was the mother that prays sitting down in her last days. The other is the daughter that would say, There is so little food and water given to us in Kufa and Sham that Zainab gives it to the children. And so weakness means that she has to pray sitting down. Zainab you are Ummul Masaib, your tragedy is great, but if I can say something, let me say this. At least when you would be praying sitting down, your ribs were not broken. But when Zahra prays sitting down, her ribs are broken. She complains and says, Ya Ali, what have the Ummah of Rasulullah done to Rasulullah until she becomes weaker and she becomes weaker on one occasion اختسلت فاطمة she puts on the best of clothing she tells Asma, I will be in this room doing Qara'at al-Dua wal-Qur'an wal-Ruku'i wal-Sujud and if you call out my name and I do not respond, then understand that I am Ra'ih Ra'ilatun ila Rabbi. I have gone towards my Lord Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Dakhalat al hujra She began her salah. She faces towards the Qibla until suddenly in Qata'a sawtuha. سقطت على مصلاها. She falls on her prayer mat. Asma would call out from behind the door, "Ya bint Rasulullah." Ya Fatima Juzara. She says, I would not hear a response. I would say, Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. Zahra has left, left this world. Suddenly, Hazan and Hussein enter into the house. Um Asma says, I open the door and they would enter. They would ask straight away, where is our mother Fatima? Asma would say, first have your dinner, then come to see your mother. They would say, never in our lives do we eat without our mother Fatima. Take us to our mother first, then we shall eat. Asma says, I tried to make them eat. They wouldn't listen, they entered into the hujra. 
They find her covered in her clothing. Hassan goes to the head. Hussein touches the feet of his mother. When suddenly Hassan looks at Hussein and says, "Adam Allah lekal ayyajr." Our mother has left this world. They begin to cry and lament. They hug their mother Fatima. They suddenly. Run towards the masjid. People thought, Why are they running to the masjid? Maybe they came to visit their grandfather. They ran into the masjid. One of them would say, Ya Abata, Ma Tatumuna Fatim. Ya Abata, Zahra has left this world. Ali that can pick up the gate of Khaybar. Ali who is Asadullah Ida Sala Wasah. What is the reaction of Amirul Mu'mineen when they would say this? Sakata ala al ard. He falls on the ground. How many steps are there from the masjid to the house? But the riwayah says he takes one or two steps then he sits down on the ground he gets up and tries to walk again then he sits down on the ground until eventually he sees the body covered inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'oon he then begins the ghusl and the kafan Zainab says I could hear as I was standing on the other side of the door when suddenly my father begin, began to walk and began to cry. I said, Oh, my father has the tragedy of losing our mother overtaken you with grief. What was the answer of Ali? He says, No, rather my hand just fell upon her broken rib. And there are certain wounds on her body that she did not tell me about until for one last time, Hassan Hussein Zainab Um Kulthum, they do the ziyara of their mother one last time. Hussein will hug the chest of Fatima. Hassan is next to the head. Zainab and Um Kulthum surround the body until then, based on her wasiya. They take her to be buried at night time. However, how close is a daughter to her mother? But Zainab says, I would stay in the house as I saw the coffin leave for one last time. Then the night would come. The night after the death and the daughter wishes to visit the grave of her mother. She asks Ali, when can I go to see the grave of my mother? What is the response of Amir al He says, when it is dark and no one can see you, O Zainab, then I will take you to see your mother. I say, Ya Ali, even when she wishes to visit Qabr Fatima, you make sure that no one can see see her come to Kufa and Sham and see how she was paraded in these streets. And now it begins when Ahlul Bayt begin to mourn and cry for their mother Fatima to Zahra that in Medina then someone would see Ali ibn Abi Talib. He says he opened the door, Amirul Mu'mineen opened the door. He says, I would see tears flowing down the eyes of Ali ibn Abi Talib. I would say, Ya Ali, death is normal for you as part of Ahlul Bayt. What was the reply? He says, I do not cry just because of the day. I cry for I was given an aman by Rasulullah. But when I gave this amana back, her body was bruised. Her ribs had been crushed. 
على لعنة الله على القوم الظالمين وسيعلم الذين ظلموا أي منقلب ينقلبون إنا لله وإنا إليه راضون